Okay, this slide shows the picture of a diagram of a pancreas. Okay, this yellow structure here is the pancreas, which consists of a head, body, and tail. Okay, as you all know, the pancreas is a retroperitoneal organ where the head uh, nicely sits into the C shape of the second part of the duodenum. Okay, there are two types of cells in the pancreas, the exocrine and the exo uh, endocrine. The end exocrine uh, glands occupy 80% of the cells and these are the acina cells which secrete the digestive juice into these glands. These digestive juices consist of, uh, contains amylase, trypsin and lipase. Together they are known as the digestive enzymes and these are carried by the into the main pancreatic duct which runs through the body uh, throughout the length of the pancreas and it enters into the second part of the duodenum as the ampulla of water after being joined by the CBD. Therefore, the digestive enzymes are secreted into the second part of the duodenum. The other gland is known as the islet the glands of the pancreatic islets which constitute about 20% of the cells. Okay, the islets of Langerhans, which consists of two types of cells, the alpha cells which produce glucagon and the beta cells produce insulin. These two come under the endocrine glands, as the endocrine glands, which produce pancreatic hormones, insulin and glucagon. The pancreas is closely associated with the second part of the duodenum the splenic artery and vein, and the lower part of the hilum of the spleen. These are important when operations of the, on the pancreas are contemplated. As I said, the pancreas consists of exocrine portion, which is the predominant uh, component, and an endocrine portion, which contributes less than one quarter of the gland. The exocrine portion is responsible for secreting serum amylase, the most widely used blood test for pancreatic damage, serum lipase, and serum trypsin. Lipase for the digestion of fats and trypsin for the digestion of uh, protein. Other enzymes include elastase and chemotrypsin. The endocrine portion, which consists of clusters of islets of Langerhans, of pancreatic islets consists of three types of cells A cells, alpha cells which secrete glucagon, B cells or the beta cells secrete insulin, and the D or delta cells secrete somatostatin. The most predominant component is the B cells or the beta cells which secrete insulin, which reduces the blood sugar. Glucagon increases the blood sugar. Now, the exocrine function being the most uh, predominant function of the pancreas, what stimulates its secretion? Okay, what stimulates the pancreatic secretion of these enzymes? Basically, the stimulus comes from two main sources. One is the presence of food in the, duty, from the, in the duodenum, which prompts or stimulates the duodenal mucosal cells to secrete secretin and cholecystokinin, which have a positive uh, influence on the pancreatic secretions. The second stimulus is the vagus nerve, which increases the volume of these secretions from the pancreas. Now, for pancreatic uh, diseases, certain investigations are commonly done, which uh, include the list I mentioned, uh, listed here, blood tests, especially serum amylase and lipase, sometimes certain Immunoglobulins can be done for immuno, uh, immune diseases, uh, immunostimulatory diseases. Urine tests, amylase, trypsinogen 2, and diastase also increase in patients with pancreatic damage. Stool tests, fecal tests, and stool elastase tests are also important to assess the function of the pancreas. Ultrasound abdomen to detect mass lesions, dilated ducts, and pancreatic calcifications. CT scan is a very important diagnostic modality for
for detecting enlargement of the pancreas, tumors, and acute necrosis. MRCP is another important diagnos uh, diagnostic tool, especially it gives a very good imaging of the pancreatic and bile ducts. Endoscopic ultrasound or EUS for close-up view of the lower end of the pancreas, the head of the pancreas and the pancreatic ducts and even doing endoscopic biopsies of this region. The last one I mentioned here is the pancreatic function test or PFT which is also known as the secretion, secretin simulation test. Okay. Okay, what are the diseases that we will be covering today? The four important diseases of the pancreas are acute pancreatitis, chronic pancreatitis, pseudocyst of the pancreas, and carcinoma of the pancreas. Okay, congenital anomalies of the pancreas are seen on and off in children, and these are some of them which we will not cover in detail today. Now we come to Pancreatitis. Okay, pancreatitis is inflammation of the pancreas. There are two, generally there are two types of pancreatitis, acute and chronic. Acute pancreatitis is an acute onset and severe. It tends to be either mild or severe. Okay, this is due to the severity of the inflammatory process. In mild cases, there's interstitial edema with mild pancreatic dysfunction. And most of the cases, uh, almost 80% of the cases, fall into this category. And the mortality rate from this is low. In severe pancreatitis, where there is severe inflammation, there is severe pancreatic necrosis and a massive inflammation. And about 20% of cases fall into this category. And uh, the mortality rate of severe pancreatitis is high. 20 to 50 percent depending on the involvement of other organs which we shall see in a short while. There can be multi-organ failure within the first week which is very severe and also there can be secondary septic complications, pancreatic abscess, septicemia if the patient pulls through into the second week. The second group of uh, inflammatory conditions is known as chronic inflammatory or chronic pancreatitis. This is due to either a continuation of the acute inflammatory process or, or recurrent attacks of mild inflammatory processes leading to final uh, chronic inflammatory disease. It is a very re irreversible morphologic logical changes that takes place in the pancreas, chronic inflammatory changes, calcification, fibrosis, and pain and permanent loss of pancreatic function are the ultimate results of uh, chronic pancreatitis, okay, which is tend to be very progressive, leading to severe pain, chronic pain, and permanent loss of pancreatic function. Okay, now we will go into details of acute pancreatitis. Acute pancreatitis is a very, very important condition in surgery. Okay, it's not only important because of the severity of the pain, but also the severe the mortality that is related to severe inflammation. The causes are mainly biliary stones and alcoholism. Okay, biliary stones or gallstones is the major in our country is the most common cause of acute pancreatitis. And this is usually uh, due to a passage of a small gallstone through the lower end of the bile duct, resulting in transient obstruction of the pancreatic duct, leading to acute inflammation. Alcoholism is another important cause. It's the second most common cause. About 20 to 25 percent of cases fall into this category. And others include trauma such as blunt abdominal trauma is resulting in injury to the pancreas and the pancreatic ducts. Surgical trauma, especially post-operation in the region of the pancreas and also post-ERCP, which is becoming an important
cause of acute pancreatitis due to the wide, wide use of ERCP these days. Ampullary tumors also can cause uh, very ampullary tumors by causing or blocking the pancreatic duct can lead to acute inflammation and acute pancreatitis. Certain drugs such as steroids, azotyprine and thiazides are three notable group of drugs that can cause inflammation. Hypercalcemia, especially in patients with hyperparathyroidism, high level of serum calcium levels can predispose to acute pancreatitis. Then we have infections, especially viral infections. Most important is mumps and Coxsackie B virus infection. And mumps is the common cause of uh, acute pancreatitis and it occurs in children or young adults. Scorpion bite has been documented as an important cause of severe uh, inflammatory reaction of the pancreas. Malnutrition, annular pancreas, and the other last one is a hereditary due to autoimmune diseases. Okay, and these are usually classified as idiopathic causes. Okay, this is a summary, of the pictorial summary of the causes of acute pancreatitis. Heavy alcohol abuse and gallstones, most, two most common causes. In fact, in our country, gallstone is far more common than alcohol and 20% of other causes. The other causes include abdominal trauma, certain medications, which I should mention just now, infections, especially viral, tumors, genetic or anatomical variants, high cholesterol or triglyceride levels, and high calcium levels. Now we come to the pathogenesis of acute uh, pancreatitis. There are three main enzymes, as you all know, that is mainly coming from the pancreas. This, the first one, is trypsin and chemotrypsin, which are responsible for digestion of proteins. The second enzyme is the amylase, which is predominantly a digestive digestion of carbohydrates and lipase, which breaks down fats. Okay, so these are the three main en uh, enzymes from the pancreas, and they are responsible for digestion of uh, carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. Acute inflammation occurs when there is an abnormal activation of digestive enzymes. Okay, the word is abnormal of normal activation of digestive enzymes within the pancreas. This occurs because of the inappropriate activation of the precursors of these enzymes which are inactive. Okay, and these are known as zymogens or proenzymes. So these zymogens or proenzymes are the precursors of the active enzymes. So these precursors are activated and this in turn activate the enzymes to active form. Inside the pancreas, the most notable of these uh, precursor enzymes or proenzymes is trypsinogen. Okay, here we have here noxious stimuli of various causes. They in, in, inappropriately activate the pre precursor enzymes pre and proenzymes, trypsinogen, and trypsinogen becomes active trypsin, activated to become active trypsin, and this results in auto-digestion of the pancreas. And that is the damage that is done in acute pancreatitis. The most common cause, as I said, is the cause of, is gallstone, is the cause of acute pancreatitis. Eh? This diagram shows you the setup uh, the biliary tree at the lower end of the biliary tree. The bile duct, common bile duct and the pancreatic duct join to form the ampulla of water and that empties into the duodenum. Okay, 
this uh, close up here ampulla of water a stone that passes through this ampulla of water causes a transient blockage of the pancreatic duct and that triggers a acute inflammatory process so in the acute inflammatory process the main damage is the acina cells which are injured uh, injury uh, acina cell injury which releases activated enzymes and this causes interstitial edema proteolysis fat necrosis and hemorrhage due to elastase okay. what causes this acina a number of factors that can be contributed or attributed to the acina injury one is direct injury of these acina cells such as by alcohol drugs trauma and ischemia okay in patients with uh, generalized ischemia and certain viruses which i mentioned earlier okay this cause direct in act, uh, injury to the cell and that releases the activation activated enzymes other causes would be duct obstruction pancreatic duct obstruction such as gallstone obstruction and chronic alcoholism and the two most common causes this will cause inflammation ischemia and further injury to the acina cells and this acina cells injury again goes into activate the enzymes the third mechanism is a defective intracellular transport such as can be caused by metabolic injury alcohol or duct obstruction okay in these conditions the delivery of proenzymes to the lysocyte compartment is affected and there's intracellular activation of enzyme leading to acina cell injury what are the types of pancreatitis generally clinically there are two types of pancreatitis one is known as interstitial and the other one is necrotizing interstitial in the uh, pancreatitis there is acute inflammation okay and uh, fortunately vast majority of patients 90% of cases fall into this category and 20% of them can be become more severe all right only 20 most of them fall into the inflammatory or interstitial list and this because of the accumulation of fluid due to the inflammation patient the patients may lead to the formation of cirrhosis the mortality rate is about 2% in the other form of uh, acute pancreatitis is called the necrotizing pancreatitis where the inflammation proceeds or progresses on to form necrosis of severe, uh, varying severity okay if it's severe necrosis then the patient becomes severely ill and about 10% of patients fall into this category 10% of acute pancreatitis fall into this category where there's progression of this inflammation to massive necrosis usually moderate or severe pancreatitis is the outcome of this condition and if it is severe it may lead to shock and multi organ failure next we come to the clinical presentation of acute pancreatitis eh? first the symptoms the most predominant or the most prominent symptom of acute pancreatitis is upper abdominal pain the pain is usually in the upper abdomen epigastric region upper uh, lower epigastric region around the umbilicus more to the left the pain usually radiates to the back okay that means from front to back relief by bending forwards or lying in a curled up position and the abdominal pain feels worse after eating is precipitated by food or aggravated by food and there is significant degree of nausea and vomiting and even retching eh? so vomiting is a very prominent symptom in these patients so the pain and vomiting are very important abdominal uh, of abdominal symptoms next the signs can be due to the inflammation there can be fever usually tachycardia dyspnea 
jaundice, tenderness, grey tenderness and colon sign, silent abdomen, eh? silent abdomen, that means on auscultation, there are hardly any bowel sounds and there is also leukocytosis. This tenderness and sometimes there is guarding is maximum around the area of the umbilicus and epigastric feature. This is a picture showing you the classical uh, picture of a pain in severe acute pancreatitis. So I said the onset is acute, side epigastric or upper abdomen, mostly on the left side. Character is agonizing, eh? very severe pain, agonizing pain, burning, continuous, and most of the time it does not relieve with normal medication. Some people describe it as excruciating pain, radiation towards the back, chest and lower abdomen, sometimes may mimic an aortic aneurysm rupture or a myocardial infarction, an aggravating factor by lying supine, supine position, patient unable to lie in the supine position or refuses to lie down to be examined, and relieving factors sitting up and leaning forward as shown in this picture okay leaning forward to leave and applying pressure to his upper abdomen to relieve the pain a bit here another patient upper epigastric pain more on the left side patient bends forward to relieve the pain here this patient lies up in a curled up position applying pressure to relieve the pain in the epigastric region and this patient again lying in a curled up position and having severe pain. If they straighten the legs, it causes stretching of the peritoneum and that causes pain. So this is to reflex mechanism to reduce the pain. This is the Cullen sign, ecchymosis around the umbilicus. This is in severe hemorrhagic pancreatitis that is bleeding into the abdominal tissues and gray turner sign lateral and posterior abdominal wall bruising also okay around the umbilicus cullen sign bruising around the umbilicus and turner sign side of the abdomen huh? lateral wall of the abdomen yeah turner sign lateral abdominal wall lateral and posterior abdominal wall extending into the upper part of the right thigh so diagnosis these three things are very important. Acute pancreatitis of so diagnosis is typical abdominal pain and vomiting. Serum amylase or lipase three times is normal limit. And the characteristic CT, find, CT findings, which I will show you in a short while. Now, what are the differential diagnosis of acute pancreatitis? So, it's a patient, it's a young, usually a patient, young patients with severe abdominal pain, acute onset, vomiting and signs of peritonitis. So these are the common differential diagnosis for this condition. Perforated peptic ulcer, acute cholecystitis, ascending cholangitis, acute appendicitis with perforation, acute intestinal obstruction, acute mesenteric ischemia with gangrene, acute myocardial infarction, and abdominal aortic aneurysm rupture or leaking. Okay, so these are all causes of acute abdomen. Next, we come to the assessment of the patient. Right? One of the conditions uh, that we use, one of the criteria that we use to the, the uh, scoring system that we use to determine the severity is called Ransom score. Benson score is the uh, number of factors or parameters that are taken into consideration during admission and within the first 48 hours in admission. The factors that you take on admission, age more than 55 years old, white cell count more than 16,000 per cubic millimeter, blood glucose more than 11 millimoles per liter, with no history of diabetes colitis, lactate. Dehydrogenase more than 350 units per liter and 
aspartate amino transferase or AST more than 250 units per liter. Okay, so these are the five parameters that you assess during admission. Okay, any and any of them exceeds these limits are given a point each. Then you observe the patient during the 48 hours with treatment and then you continue to monitor the patient and the following parameters. And the uh, fall in HT, HCT, blood urea nitrogen, rise, arterial oxygen saturation uh, decrease, uh, decrease, serum calcium or falling serum calcium, in, uh, base deficit more, uh, increasing base deficit and also the fluid sequestration more than 6 liters. So you look for these parameters within the 48 hours. Okay, this is a uh, chart summarizing the thing on admission and in 48 hours. Huh? These are the parameters that you look on admission and within the 48 hours. And each of them has got one point, a score of one point, a total of 11 points. The score of three or greater predicts severe acute pancreatitis. Okay, so a score of below three is considered mild pancreatitis and the prognosis is very important. Why is this important? Because on admission, patient may come with mild pancreatitis, but in the ward, it can progress very rapidly into severe uh, pancreatitis and multi-organ failure. So this chart or the scoring system here helps to assess the severity of the pancreatitis. So Ransom score and severity, eh? actually it helps to predict the severity and outcome of acute pancreatitis at 48 hours after onset of illness. Mild pancreatitis, less than 5% mortality with less than three risk factors. Severe pancreatitis, 15 to 20% mortality with three to four risk factors. So as the risk factors increase, the mortality rate also increases. To the, to the extent that if there are more than seven factors, almost uh, uh, the mortality is almost 100%. This table is the revised Atlanta criteria for acute pancreatitis, uh, which I find it uh, easy or convenient uh, classification between mild, moderate, and severe pancreatitis. Okay, with mild pancreatitis, there's no organ failure. There's no local complications such as pancreatic fluid collections, pancreatic necrosis, and there are no systemic complications. And such cases typically resolve within the first week, in a couple of days. Okay, in moderate pancreatitis, there's transient or organ failure, which recovers within 48 hours. So it may go into acute renal failure, and within 48 hours, recover. They can have no look or, or they have local complications or exacerbation of comorbid diseases. Either one of these. Eh? So either this, they go into moderate acute pancreatitis. And in severe pancreatitis, there's persistent organ failure. And the organ failure lasts more than 48 hours or maybe become even permanent, such as known as very severe pancreatitis. So it's, this classification is quite easy to understand. Now, the investigations of acute pancreatitis, which I've already mentioned, serum amylase, elevated more than three times above normal. Usually it rises within hours of an attack and drops within the first week, with a couple of days. Serum lipase, the half-life is longer, so it, its elevation in the blood lasts longer than the serum amylase. So it is more reliable if the patient comes to you after a couple, one or two days after the acute attack. Urine diastase is another important test in the urine for the diastase. The pancreatic damage has increased in urine diastase. Next, we come to the imaging in acute pancreatitis. 
plain x-ray and checks x-ray are important. You can detect local ileus, sentinel loop, okay, or colon cutoff sign, renal halo sign. These are all important radiological signs. Eh? An x-ray may show the presence of a gallstone. Chest x-ray especially is very important to diagnose air, free air under the diaphragm eh? because perforated peptic ulcer is a common differential diagnosis. And also x-rays will be able to detect effusion, eh? pleural effusion and diffuse interstitial shadows. Okay, so these are the role of plain x-ray abdomen. Ultrasound scan of the abdomen is a very important initial investigation aimed mainly to detect gallstone. And then contrast enhanced CT scan is also very important for severe cases, especially to look for necrosis, enlarged gland pancreas, necrosis or formation of an abscess. MRI scans may be used in the initial stages when the patient are not uh, fit so you can for other invent, uh, interventional procedures so you can do MRI to detect the bile duct stones the cause of pancreatic duct situation of the pancreatic duct and the last one I told you is the EUS endoscopic ultrasound which affords uh, gives us a closer imaging of the CVD and the pancreatic ducts okay this is a CT scan showing you a massively enlarged pancreas. This is the tail. This is the head with severe necrosis. Okay, this is a severe pancre uh, acute pancreatitis. Okay, this is a cutoff sign. It shows a localized ileus and distension of the transverse colon due to the ileus of this area due to the underlying. Uh, acute inflammation of the pancreas. Inflammatory exudate in pancreatitis extends into this phrenocolic ligament. Okay, phrenocolic ligament, and that holds up this uh, intraperitoneal part as a dilated loop. This is a abdominal ultrasound, okay, abdominal ultrasound of the this thing, and this shows you the, the enlarged pancreas here, the enlarged pancreas, and in the middle runs the pancreatic duct, which is also dilated, okay, the red arrow shows here. Here, again, a huge pancreas, okay, this is a huge pancreas, it's dilated, and there's some fluid there. This is an EUS endoscopic ultrasound which clearly shows a stone in the lower end of the CBD or ampulla of, the duct, of water which is clearly causing obstruction of the pancreatic ducts. Another one, stone in the CBD. Okay. So these are the different CT scans of a normal pancreas. Okay. Normally you can see here, this is a normal pancreas, tail, body, and the head here. This is an uh, acute pancreatitis, uh, gall blood uh, pancreas, diffusely swollen. Okay, and this is a pseudocyst that is formed in an inflamed pancreas. Acute pancreatitis complicating the pseudocyst. Okay, what are the systemic complications of acute pancreatitis? Okay, which are more common in the first week of severe pancreatitis. Uh? So I told you systemic complications usually occur in like, severe pancreatitis and usually occurs within a couple of days, within the first week. Cardiovascular complications can be hypovolemic shock, arrhythmias, pulmonary complications, atelectasis, pleural effusion and pneumonia and some patients can end up with ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome, Renal complications are, is a very common uh, systemic complication. Acute renal failure due to intravascular, severe intravascular volume depletion or acute tubular necrosis. 
less common systemic complications or hematological DIVC, disseminated intravascular coagulation leading to bleeding tendency, metabolic complications, hypocalcemia, hyperglycemia, and hyperlipidemia, gastrointestinal complication, paralytic ileus, stress ulceration and bleeding, and neurological visual disturbances, patient becomes conf uh, confused, irritable, or even go into encephalopathy and coma. Local complications are more common than systemic complications. Local complications include and this usually develop in the after the first week. Okay, and this usually include acute fluid collection. Okay, this occurs in early and still defined wall and around the pancreas. And later it can form a pseudocyst of the pancreas, which is a very uh, common complication of acute pancreatitis. Pancreatic necrosis initially is sterile, sterile, later it becomes back secondarily infected, causing it to become a pancreatic abscess. Usually, this may need a percutaneous aspiration or open necrosectomy and tube drainage for infected necrosis. Pancreatic abscess, when it is secondarily infected with bacteria. Pancreatic ascites, which may need peris peritoneal synthesis. Hemorrhage into the gut retroperitoneum or peritoneal cavity in severe hemorrhagic pancreatitis and portal vein or splenic vein thrombosis. Okay, this is a CT scan showing you massive necrosis of the pancreas, body and tail of the pancreas. Yeah, this is a pseudosis and the collection later becomes well encysted and that's known as a pseudosis. Here is a pseudocyst when the wall of the cyst is formed by the surrounding tissues that is called a pseudocyst. Okay, massive necrosis and here necrosis secondarily infected bacteria and forms a pancreatic abscess. Next we come to the treatment of acute pancreatitis. Fluids very important. Eh? Adequate early fluid resuscitation, especially within the 24 hours, first 24 hours, is utmost importance. Eh? I must stress to you. Patient is usually very dehydrated, and uh, so you must give adequate fluids. Nutritional support, enteral uh, or parenteral feeding may need to be given. Patient unable to eat because of severe ileus and vomiting, pain control, usually they need opiates, morphine and other opiates, treatment of underlying cause, which if other organs are involved, then you will give supportive treatment, it's a multidisciplinary uh, management, acute renal failure may need hemolysis, multi-organ failures gall and the gallstone must be treated, removal of the gallstone. Drugs, somatostatin, which decreases the secretion of the pancreas. Okay, nowadays you have the uh, synthetic versions known as the octreotide. Patients may need PPI to prevent stress ulceration and if infected, need severe uh, high dose of antibiotics. Most of these patients need intensive monitoring in HDU or ICU. And definitive treatment is endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreatography or ERCP with spinterectomy to remove the stone at the lower end of the CBD or ampullary stones. So I must stress general and resuscitative measures are very important initially followed by definitive treatment. Surgery for local complications, definitive surgery, initially if the patient is deaf, uh, you give, subject the patient to 
aggressive, resuscitative and supportive to stabilize the patient, early ERCP and spindolotomy, followed by laparoscopic cholecystectomy to remove the gallstones. For complications, drainage of the cirrhosis, known as cyst gastrostomy, which can be done either endoscopically or laparoscopically. Necrosectomy, removal of necrotic tissue, disrupting of the necrotic pancreas, and there's abscess, drainage of abscess. So these procedures all can be done through endoscope, laparoscope, or open surgery. A short uh, reminder about the pancreatic cirrhosis, which is a collection of amylase rich fluid enclosed in a wall of fibrous or granulation tissue and it usually surrounding the pancreas which is acutely inflamed. Occurs four weeks or more after acute pancreatitis. Can also occur after chronic pancreatitis or after pancreatic trauma. Okay. Clinical presentation, non-mobile, non-tender epigastric mass. Complications of pancreatic cirrhosis, infection, abscess formation, and septicemia, rupture into the gut, compression of the biliary tree with causing obstructive jaundice, can cause bowel obstruction, sudden pain from hemorrhage into the cirrhosis. The treatment is of cirrhosis is by percutaneous transgastric gastrocystostomy. Endoscopic drainage through stomach or open gastrocystostomy. The idea of this treatment is to drain the cyst into the stomach. Okay, either percutaneously, endoscopically, or through open method. Okay, this is how it's done. This is the stomach. This is the anterior wall is opened up. Inside is the posterior wall. And the yellowish color at the back is the cyst, contents of the pseudocyst. So what you do is, you open the wall in the posterior wall of the stomach and create a fistula. Cyst, cystogastrostomy. So the contents of the fistula drains into the stomach and then when the pressure becomes negative, this will seal by itself. So this is known as a open cyst gastrostomy or cystogastrostomy. Next we come to chronic pancreatitis. Chronic pancreatitis, as the name suggests, is recurrent attacks of acute pancreatitis leading to chronicity of the inflammation. Usually they present with severe chronic pain, exocrine and endocrine insufficiency. Okay. Pancreatic insufficiency. Males, the female ratio is 4 is to 1 and mainly affects males above 40 years of old age. Causes, two main causes. Chronic alcoholism is the most common cause and pancreatic obstruction from various causes, strictures, tumors or chronic fibrosis. Okay, these are the common causes. Other causes include Carcinoma of the pancreas, basically due to obstruction of the pancreatic duct. Pancreatic pancreas divisum or annular pancreas. Hereditary pancreatitis, which is got a family history of chronic pancreatitis. Cystic fibrosis, malnutrition, autoimmune pancreatitis, hyperlipidemia and hypercalcemia, usually in hyperparathyroidism. The clinical presentation of chronic pancreatitis is recurrent severe episodes of dull, gnawing epigastric pain Great, uh, and also the subcostal pain, epigastric and subcostal pain. More to the left side, occasionally the pain radiates to the back or to the left shoulder. Usually these attacks are associated with nausea, vomiting, weight loss, and patient becomes chronically inability to work. 
because of the pain, he becomes addicted to analgesic abuse, especially narcotic analgesics, dependence, statoria, stools contain a lot of undigested fat and malabsorption. In late cases, patient can also develop diabetes mellitus due to destruction of the islet cells. So, in the pathology of chronic pancreatitis, the gland pancreas is enlarged, hard and fibrotic pancreas, stricture, stricture and dilated ducts with calcified stones. Okay, uh, numerous dilated, dilated ducts like a beaded experience uh, appearance with calcified stones within these ducts. Ducts are occluded with inflammatory cysts that are seen scattered all over. Okay. These are some of the investigations. Chronic hematitis, serum amylase may be elevated in early stages, but later as the gland becomes destroyed, amylase becomes normal. Plain X-ray abdomen may be able to show you pancreatic calcifications. Then the CT scan will show dilated pancreatic ducts here yeah, can you see here dilated pancreatic ducts with calcif with calcification here yeah, cp shows you shows you the same multiple areas of structured pancreatic ducts with circulations huh? and these are known as chain of legs or beaded experience uh, sorry beaded uh, appearance this is a plain x-ray of the abdomen showing you the calcification, okay, massive or dense calcification in the region of the uh, pancreas. Patient with symptoms and signs suggestive of chronic pancreatitis and with the x-ray finding of this is more or, low, more or less diagnostic of chronic pancreatitis. Treatment for chronic pancreatitis, mostly medical. Control of pain, very important. I say patient become addicted to the analgesics, improve digestion, giving supplements because the pancreas is not able to produce enough of enzymes to digest. So these enzymes, a lot of uh, enzyme preparations that are available, which patient has to take before meals. And also control of diabetes. Intervention, interventional treatment is to relieve obstruction of the pancreatic duct. If all means of pain kill, uh, relieving pain fails, then you may have to resort to relieve the obstruction of the pancreatic duct. Then you must need to treat the complications such as pseudocysts or abscesses that may develop, fistula, ascites, varices, endoscope, and this relief of obstruction can be done through endoscopic procedures, ARCP, by doing a spinterotomy and placement of stents across the strictures in the pancreatic duct, drainage of pseudoducts uh, through pseudo, uh, pseudocysts through ARCP, and lastly, surgery, to remove any mass lesion that may cause obstruction, to remove such obstruction. Next, we come to the important topic of carcinoma of the pancreas. Okay, carcinoma of the pancreas, there are four main types. The most common is the ductal adenocarcinoma, which is respond, or which comprises 85% of all malignancies of the pancreas or tumors of the pancreas. It occurs mainly in the head of the pancreas. Pathologically, it is a solid with fibrosis and uh, serious type of uh, lesion. It is difficult often to differentiate clinically from chronic pancreatitis. Often needle, as needle biopsies are needed to confirm the diagnosis, which are these days much easier, much easier done by using the EUS, endoscopic ultrasonic uh, methods. 
it's a precursor, it's a pancreat, it's the precursor of such tumors is the pancreatic intraepithelial neoplasia or PA pan in, which is a form of carcinoma I would say too, which predisposes to the development of frank carcinoma of the pancreas. Carcinoma of the pancreas tend to infiltrate locally along the nerve sheaths, your lymphatics and blood vessels. Liver and peritoneal metastasis are also common. Serous cystadenoma is the another important group of diseases, benign disease, which is off, on and off can, can occur in the pancreas. And usually they, they tend, uh, usually they are benign, but the, they can grow big size and cause pressure symptoms. Whereas mucinous cystadenoma uh, have a malignant potential. The long, on the long run, they can become malignant. Endocrine tumors of the pancreas are relatively rare as there is a lot of uh, endocrine cells and tissues in the pancreas. These tumors do occur from, from time to time. What are the risk factors for carcinoma of the pancreas? Age is a very important factor usually occurs in elderly people above uh, 65 years of age. Males are more common. Cigarette or tobacco smoking is a predisposing factor. Family history, higher family history in such cases. Hereditary pancreatitis, chronic pancreatitis also in the long term predisposes to cancer, cancer of the pancreas. Hereditary non polyposis colorectal cancer, ataxia telangiectasia, ataxic telangiectasia, Hutz Jugas syndrome, familial adenomatous polyp, and diabetes mellitus. Okay, these are some of the risk factors for the development of pancreatic cancer. Now, what is the clinical presentation of carcinoma of the pancreas? Again, this depends on the site of the tumor. The most common site, as I said, is the pancreatic head and the ampullary region. Okay, in this diagram, uh, this is the region, uh, the peri ampullary region and the pancreatic head. Okay, normally these patients present with jaundice, and classically it's painless jaundice, painless obstructive jaundice. They develop severe pruritus itchiness, dark urine due to the presence of a conjugate, high amount of conjugated bilirubin in the urine, pale stools due to lack of stercobilinogen and statoria, and mal malabsorption of fats. Later they develop nausea, epigastric pain and even an epigastric mass Weight loss becomes a very important feature of carcinoma head of the pancreas and hepatomegaly with enlarged or palpable gallbladder. This is in keeping with the Covasius law, which states that in case of obstructive jaundice, enlarged gallbladder, obstruction is not due to stones, most likely due to carcinoma. The carcinoma of the head of the pancreas is one of the more common causes of such findings. Next, carcinoma head of the, located on the body or tail of the pancreas. These do not uh, present very easily. They present very vague symptoms, vague discomfort, anorexia, weight loss, chronic back pain, epigastric discomfort with recent onset of diabetes mellitus in patients over 40 years of age, unexplained pancreatitis, patient develops pancreatitis, there's no gallstone, there's no uh, alcoholic intake, and there's no predisposing factors in this patient, then you have to think of uh, carcinoma of the body or tail of pancreas. 
advanced case with enlarged vulcan nodes, ascites, abdominal and pelvic metastasis. That means there are evidence of metastasis, but the primary is unable to be detected on clinical grounds. So an important fact that you must remember is unexplained weight loss in elderly patients. You must always one of the con uh, factors or of the causes must be included is carcinoma pancreas, especially body or tail of the pancreas, which may not produce uh, uh, clinical obstructive jaundice. The investigation for carcinoma of the pancreas is as follows. Eh? If a patient is obstructive jaundice, then urine and blood tests should be done to confirm. You must do a prothrombin time and the CA199. Prothrombin time is important in patients with carcinoma of pancreas with obstructive jaundice because it is commonly prolonged in obstructive jaundice and this can predispose to bleeding tendency, especially when surgical procedures are concerned. Ultrasound scan of the abdomen will able to reveal a dilated biliary tree and even the possible uh, cause of the obstruction, which is in not many cases. Contrast enhanced CT scan, CECT, is the best method of uh, exa examining or best method of investigation to detect carcinoma of the pancreas, head as well as the body and tail. It also can be used to stage the disease and decide on the resectability of the tumor. Okay. If the tumor is seen on CT scan and resectable, then on ultrasound, then you go proceed to surgery without undertaking further invasive uh, investigations. Okay. However, if the tumor is unresectable on CT scan or clinically, then ERCP with biliary stenting is the best option for the patient. If, on the other hand, no tumor is seen, then this, the patient would need an ERCP with brush cytology and or biopsy if it is an ampullary tumor. These days, transduodenal or transgastric FNAC under EUS guidance has become the diagnosis, diagnostic method of choice where you can get look have a closer view of the lower end of the pancreatic duct as well as the head of the pancreas and do a transduodenal biopsy of this area to confirm whether it is confirmed the cancer and also the nature of the cancer. Then come to the next we come to the pancreatic cancer staging. Pancreatic cancer the T staging and T staging TNM staging the T staging is T1 and 2 limited to within the pancreas. Okay within the tissues of the pancreas. T1 tumor size less than 2 centimeters and T2 more than 2 centimeters. T3, when the tumor infiltrates into the duodenum or infiltrates into the spleen. Okay. Infiltration into the kidney is also considered as T3, the hilum or part of the kidney. And infiltration into the splenic vein also considered as T3. So T3 is local uh, adjacent infiltration of the tumor into the adjacent organs. The spleen, duodenum, kidney, and splenic vein. Okay, now we come to the resectability criteria for cancer of the pancreas. Okay, you can classically stage them to one, two, three, and four. In stage one, 
is resectable. The tumor is T1 or T2 within the pancreas, no lymph nodes, no metastasis. So in these cases, there's no extra hepatic disease, extra sorry, extra pancreatic disease, and there's no encasement of the cilia axis or SMA by tumor. So this is clearly resectable and major surgery can be undertaken. In stage 4 on the other side, at the end is unresectable, clearly unresectable. Tumor any size, nodal status any status, the second uh, metastasis is positive. Therefore, with ling, liver, liver, peritoneal and lung metastasis or metastasis elsewhere, it is clearly unresectable. Now, in stage 2, is considered typically resectable. So in these patients, the regional lymph nodes may be involved, but there's no encasement of the cilia axis or SMA, and there's no possible extra pancreatic. If there's no, there's no possibility of extra pancreatic involvement, then it is resectable. Whereas in stage three, where the tumor is T4 and maybe negative nodal status or N1 and metastasis is negative. Therefore, regional lymph nodes may be involved and there's encasement of the cilia axis or SMA. As a result, it is unresectable. So on all these cases, the special feature of pancreatic cancer is the encasement of the cilia axis or SMA becomes a very important deciding factor on resectability of the tumor besides uh, distant metastasis. Now we come to the management of pancreatic cancer. 85% of pancreatic carcinoma are unresectable at the time of diagnosis. If resectable, the primary surgery for carcinoma of the head of pancreas is known as a pylorus preserving pancreatoduodenectomy, PPPD, with local lymph adenectomy. Okay, so you do a pylorus preserving pancreatoduodenectomy with local lymph adenectomy. Or a people's operation where there's removal of the gastric antrum together with pancreatic duodenectomy. So this will cause more problems compared to that, but it is the ma more major operation compared to the PPPD, which is a much a bit more conservative approach, where the pylorus is left intact. This operation for tumors of the body or tail of the pancreas is a distal pancreatectomy. Okay, this is pancreatoduodenectomy, which is Ripple's procedure. The part of the stomach, the antrum and the pylorus, the duodenum, whole of the duodenum, all the four parts of the duodenum with the head of the pancreas is removed. And then pre-construction is done by a triple bypass, colidoco jejunostomy, okay, colidoco jejunostomy, jejunum with the common hepatic duct. Then the second one is the pancreatico jejunostomy, okay, pancreas, the resected part of the pancreas, anastomos with the uh, side of the jejunum. And the third one is your gastro jejunostomy. The stomach, the stump is anastomosed to the jejunum. So the jejunum is involved in a three triple bypass with the common hepatic duct, with the pancreas, and the stomach. In the pylorus preserving pancreatoduodenectomy, PPPD, okay, the difference is you remove the duodenum plus the head of the pancreas. Only difference is the stomach is left behind. Okay, so in the, 
here. You see the stomach is left behind. So the pylorus is uh, intact. Huh? The pylorus is left behind. Therefore, there is no regurgitation, reflux. Okay, the triple bypass is still there. Okay, colidoco jejunostomy, duodenal jejunostomy, and jejunal pancreatico uh, pen, uh, jejunostomy. There's no gastro jejunostomy, it's replaced with the end to side duodenal jejunostomy. If you detect the during the imaging phase, if you have detect irresectable, then what you can do is place stents either through endoscope or percutaneously. Okay, the two important obstructions are bile duct obstruction and duodenal obstruction. Bile duct obstruction being more common. Bile duct obstruction can be bypassed with using a stent percutaneously through the liver. And putting the stent into the bile duct and pushing it right into the duodenum. Okay, this is done under fluoroscopy method. Nowadays, with the use of the endoscope, which is much more easier, where you can directly you see you pass a stent through the ampulla, okay, through the papilla, pass the stent upwards. You use the expandable stent and then you can be left in place where it expands and drains the bulge. So this is through endoscopy. Or you can use a four and a endoscope to pass a stent to stand the duodenum for duodenal obstruction by the tumor. Okay. The stents uh, nowadays can be very uh, expandable metal or mesh okay which can ex expandable and it can last for a long time without getting blocked. Summary of the surgical procedures that are available. Resectable, if, that's, if it is resectable, then we do Vipers operation or PPPD, pylorus preserving pancreatic or duodenectomy, which is a the improvement of the Vipers operation. If it is unresectable, CBD obstruction, ERCP yes, stenting. Or you can do a bypass, polydoco duodenostomy, or polydoco jejunostomy, poly polycysto jejunostomy. All these are simple procedures which can be done with good palliative results. If duodenal obstruction, endoscopic stenting is the best, uh, is the Choice method, method of choice. If this fails, then gastrojejunostomia is a better bypass procedure.